Um, oh. Yeah, I guess we can we can probably start. Yeah, so today uh, we have Amel Benasser to give a, a talk about machine learning and software engineering. And Amel is an expert in, in software engineering and mainly the software engineering of adaptive and resilient systems. And her work includes the application of synthesis, verification, and machine learning, which is also part of, of today's uh, talk. And she is um, a member of the, the team of the uh, Trusted Autonomous Systems Resilience Hub. So, uh, sorry, Resilience Node. Um, <laughs> and she also has um, yeah, multiple ongoing uh, EPSRC projects on, on resilient systems and adaptive systems. So, Amel, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jan, for, for the introduction. And thank you um, for listening to me today. So, uh, I am actually going to talk about um, some of the work we did uh, at the intersection of software engineering and machine learning, and leaving a little bit kind of um, discussion and um, kind of questions as well around uh, how we take uh, this further around verifiability and assurance. But first, I'm going to take you a little bit to school. So to think about uh, how how we we learn and how we started at school, let's say, let's remember how we learned uh, doing additions. So and when we had like basically a teacher coming and giving us the rule around additions and, you know, doing it and applying the rule to multiple and multiple examples. Then I think we moved to university and I still kind of remember the the first uh, course on that algebra when the teacher kind of came and said, you know, one, two, three, natural number, define a natural number. So and the idea is we know we have examples, we know how it works, but then how to extract the rules. Then, you know, once we start, you start your PhD or you start work, you know, nobody gives you the example, nobody gives you the, the rules. You have to find everything by yourself. And to do that, usually you collaborate, you talk to people, that's kind of a, a seminar from the old go from the good old days where there was face to face, but that actually works around collaboration. So if we do the same in terms of software engineering, so we started usually, and that's still the the, the most common paradigm is we write um, software and software systems by through explicit instruction. So you write the program. And then you give it different input, different out, uh, different input, and you receive different outputs. So you, uh, well, it's simply the system is simply executing the inst instructions. Now, increasingly, there is the other thing where you actually learn through examples. So you have the data, you have you have some data, you have outcome, and you start to extract the rules. But then there is the other kind of also generation where you have multiple services, multiple systems, and all the, 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 the ecosystem emerged through collaboration, through collaboration of robots, through co collaboration between you know, services and devices and, um, and system in general and humans. So today, and that's kind of the, the topic of, the, uh, of, the, um, of this talk, we're really kind of I'm going to be kind of presenting work at the intersection of uh, between these two generations, learning from examples and also collaboration of systems. And I will be presenting two, two examples, one about using you know, machine learning and synthesis for interoperability. And we'll be discussing another example around machine learning and and the software engineering for socio-technical resilience. So first, um, a little bit about mediation and synthesis and why collaboration. So if you think of a lot of the examples we have, think for example, around um, you know, file management. So you have Dropbox, Google Drive, they, 
and sy systems that do the same thing but they are unable to collaborate. I think today is more like Zoom and Teams and Skype doing the same high level functionality but unable to, co to, to collaborate. We have sometimes robots that need to, to work together to achieve um, something. So you need their uh, collaboration. You have also a lot of devices that we make use and you want them to, to interact with one another. But often it's impossible for them to interact because they have different interfaces, they interact differently, so you know, and they are using different protocols. So the way they are implemented is using, for example, different middleware and, and different uh, data types, different protocols. So, but they need, there is a need for them to, to collaborate. So how do we enable them to collaborate? So the idea is to use this, this mediator. So mediator in this sense are, so for all the, all the fans of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is like, is there sort of a babel fish that kind of those intermediary software entities that compensate for the differences in in data, in in behavior, and in in protocols between systems, and that coordinate their behavior to satisfy given requirements. So, to give you an example, let's let's think that let's think I I, I need to protect a phone, and I keep forgetting the phone. So one example is, you know, the requirement is for protecting a phone. Another one is, you know, keeping this, this space open. And assume that we have multiple devices. We have a smart lock, we have a, a humanoid robot, we have another robot. So the idea is how do we use all those systems to satisfy those requirements? And I'm gonna show you a video that, sh that kind of exemplify that. And so is, is collaborative security because it's around protecting the devices. So here where we're, uh, my requirement is to keep the phone safe. Oh, man. you forgot your phone. So when I forget it, the human, uh, the human robot asks me to get it. Uh, so I don't come back, so they want to put the, um, the phone into a safe place. So it's about making those two devices, the human robot and this kind of vacuum cleaner, and make them collaborate to protect the, to, to hide the phone. So now that they kind of work together, Collaboratively, okay, it's set up. so they need to work together so that they have the phone in a very safe place, which is under the sofa. <laughs> but so a little bit more formally, basically we have a set of requirements. So protecting the phone, keeping the room available. We have a set of components, each with it, their own capabilities. So you have, for example, the humanoid robot, you have the, um, the, the create, so the, the vacuum cleaner, and they are deployed in an environment. So the idea is, can we satisfy the requirements with, with those devices that are available? And in this case, for example, we cannot satisfy those requirements. For example, we cannot take the phone and hide it using any one device. Actually, even taking a subset of devices, so taking just by putting the, ro the two robots together, we cannot hide the phone. So what we need is an extra entity, that mediator, that enable the two devices to talk to together. I need to move that. So, let me see. No. So we need a subset of devices, so the two robots, and we need a mediator that enable them to talk together 
to satisfy this um, the requirement. So the mediator have those three three um, three features. So and to do it, we go from a system. So rather than reasoning to with the system, we move to the model. So we have a model of each of the systems. We have a model of the environments in which um, they are operating. And the idea is to first define their interfaces, have a translation between the data. Then from that is how to coordinate the behavior, and that's the controller synthesis. So you do you you first pick, pick the phone and then the other move it to another place, for example, and that's the control. So how do you coordinate their behavior so that you reach your final state, you reach your goal of hiding the phone? And then there is the, the last thing, which is the, me, uh, the middleware synthesis, which is deploying the protocol. So for example, one is using, uh, so communication over Wi-Fi with a certain, say, REST, so HTTP, and then the other is using, for example, data encoded in, into XML. So that's the understanding the protocol underneath and deploying the, the, middleware, uh, the middleware there. So here, because models in the whole kind of synthesis are important, is first, let's just uncover what is in each model. So what's in, in the model is first, the, the capability, what the system as a whole does. Uh, does it do, you know, here, for example, is it a human -like robot? Is it a file management system? What it is. The interface is the set of actions that the system does. So, you know, for example, authenticate, move, read. And that's the set of observable actions. And there is the behavior, so how the how the actions are coordinated. So for example, you authenticate, you lock, you unlock, you log out. So that's the sequence of actions that and how they are they are done. And last is how how the how those actions are are enacted. So for example, you know to authenticate you have to send an HTTP request and receive an HTTP response. So how, how to go from the high level kind of capability or the function of the component into, into the code, into the protocol. Now, one of the, the issues is that is most system only advertise their interface. So they just, you know, only the set of actions. You don't know the capability and you don't know the behavior. So one of the question we had is, can we learn the component model. Can we extract, say, from a set of an interface, can we extract what they do with the capability and, and the behavior? And to do so, we, we, we used basically two, uh, two learning methods. One, which was a supervised learning to infer the capability, and the second one is the automata learning to extract the behavior. So for the capability is, it uses, it's in two steps. So using SVM, we had a set of interfaces to action. We have um, uh, an, ontolo an ontology saying how the different concepts and how they are represented. You train them, you have a category. We used SVM, you can use other kind of kernel methods, for example. And then you have a categorization function. And from that, when you have a new interface description, you apply this categorization function and you have an ontology concept. So the way we classified is using uh, an interface description language, which is Whistle, and we use super supported vector machines to do the, the text categorization. So Whistle is an XML, XML based, which means it's textual. textual. And then we extract the, the basically distinguishing features which are words. So for example, if you have this, uh, this whistle description, then you extract what, what are the relevant words, and then from that you can extract which, which service it is. It's a weather service, it's about you know, um, 
zip code and uh, and its user soap for example so from that we we used it to to identify which um, service so how to map the services together which services need to to interact and that kind of this learned capabilities allowed us to match services more quickly uh, but also kind of because they are equally rated and that's that allows us to kind of understand which which services and which um, system need to interact together now one of the issues is it was experimental so you have to play with different methods with different features so we went for example for bag of words but then it's about experimenting how do you restructure the 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 natural language whether which which word you can ignore how how the structure of the whole description works so rather than a systematic process is what it was a lot of experimentation another thing is there is this also there wasn't any guarantees about how um the, the accuracy for example it all depended it, it was all dependent on the training examples and you it, it it was about knowing um, kind of experimentally or empirically how many examples you need to, to get for each category of, of features, for example. And that kind of also afterwards uh, gave rise to a lot of failures. So there were fail failures when, when two systems were supposed to go together, but because of false, um, false negatives then we didn't make them collaborate or there are the other the other the other part where you know the model tells you that they need to collaborate but you are not able to do it because actually there is there is a mismatch in in the ontology uh, the feature you you learned so then it was there was the question is how to learn from those failure and how to create a feedback loop to learn from from failures at runtime to improve the the work and that's actually what we did for for the behavior so for the behavior in terms of automata uh, learning what we use we use um l star who probably a lot of you know um and it's about constructing a deterministic finite automata that matches uh, the behavior of the component, so how to interact with the comp uh, component best based on uh, on a test-based interaction. So it's about starting with the most general behavior, uh, and then as as counter examples emerge, then you refine the behavior. And the whole purpose of the algorithm is convergence with least. Um, number of interaction of counter examples so to give you an example a very very simple one let's let's take um, you know a simple weather service so the way uh, it starts is like we just say you know you can interact with the service in any in any kind of sequence you can you know do all actions at the same time but then you realize, say, that if you do the get weather and then log in, then there is an exception, for example. So what you do is you refine your system. You say, OK, then I have to do a login and then I can do any actions. But then you have another counterexample by doing, for example, login, log out and then get weather. There's a, another exception. So you refine it until there is no more counterexamples. So that kind of allowed us to extract the behavior and then do, um, do the coordination or the controller uh, from there. Now, one of the issues with LSTAR is that there is a strong assumption about the system to learn. And one of the assumptions is you can reset it at, uh, after uh, each um, counter example, which, not, which is not always the case. And also that you know already how to interact with the system at the lower level. However, there is no guarantees about 
the completeness or the, the convergence of the learned behavior in the most general case. So, so there is failure at, at all stages, but there is also a kind of um, examples or encouraging properties that, for example, the learned model always evolves through refinement because you start from the most general behavior and then you refine it to a more more specific um, example, uh, more specific behavior through counter examples. So that failure, however, kind of is whether you do the synthesis with uh, with assurance, you end up still with these cases, for example. So we had, for example, if the the behavior is wrong, then concretely when the two robots are interacting, then you there is failure. So uh, it, it goes on and on and on and on until you learn from the failure. So here what we wanted is, okay, so the thing we did is you start from the system, you discover them, you extract a model and then sequence, uh, like the sequence is to create a third uh, system, uh, uh, something in the middle that coordinate them and create, allow them to co co you know, cooperate, and then you execute that. However, it's always fails. So the next step is actually to, to learn from this failure and to le relearn and syn uh, synthesize. So it's not about um, only assurance, but it's about re in terms of resilience. So how do you kind of um, learn from this and keep refining uh, the behavior of each system as well as the intermediates so that you can evolve? So, and there were a lot of questions that remain. So the impact of the learning on the assurance, how do you improve the learning but after the failure and combining the assurances or the guarantees into something not necessarily as, you know, for example, a guaranteed deadlock uh, free interaction, but something as um, the same failure wouldn't happen to us. So uh, towards some more resilient kind of interactions. Uh, so, and that's, and that's kind of what takes me to the second part, which is, you know, going from um, from this kind of assurance through synthesis into, into a more resilient way of doing this and also including human in the loop. So uh, I'll just stop if there are any uh, some questions and then move on. Yes, yeah, so if there are any questions, then you can always put them in the chat or, or just raise your hand or just unmute right now. Um, and yeah, if there are questions in the chat, I will read them uh, later. OK, so I'll move to the second case, which is um, kind of mixing. Uh, now we have somebody raising a hand. Uh, <laughs> I think we just had a question. Mohammad, do you have a question? Yeah, so I, I was just wondering, uh, you assume that you're applying your learning on a fixed system of some sort, and then you, of course, um, resolve the failures. Are you going to address the issue of um, changing the system itself, or is this something for future work? It is for future work. If the system changes, then you don't know. So the synthesis is guaranteed. <laughs> so you can prove that the, the mediator is deadlock free, is, um, you know, will guarantee progression, but actually assuming that the model is correct. So you don't know whether once you fail, you don't know whether it's because it's a failure in the learning or it's a failure in the or a change in the system. So if the I think if the change is about kind of constraining, if so in L star, if it's an equivalence um, uh, request that used to work and is not working, then you know that the system changed. So we restart everything <laughs> for the moment, but. If it's uh, if it's an extra counter example, then you're not sure which which case. So that's uh, this is where we stopped basically. Okay, clear. So I 
also have a quick question about the first part. So um, in the in this collaboration, the you have to learn one model for every collaborator, right? And if your collaboration fails, then you also have to figure out which one of the models was incorrect, or or is that always clear? Yeah, no, you don't know which one, which uh, which individual component is failing at this at this stage. So one of the things that we worked is is that the mediator, the way the collaboration work is correct. So it must be the learn one of the models. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's the thing. But yes, you have to uh, kind of look at every every model. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> so uh, I'll move to the second example. So so what we tr when then is is kind of also looking at whether we include humans. So in this case, we took the the component that fails all the time, which are humans, <laughs> and try to 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 work on a, an architecture that guarantees the interaction or mediation not only between services but between humans. And the way we did it is the, through, for example, communities and circle for support. So I'll, I'll go directly to the architecture. So the, the, the high level requirement was to, for example, minimize social isolation. So allowing, um, we were focusing on older people to, 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 to kind of, um, to interact with, with their, um, with their, um, supporters. So, and to do that, we, we deployed the, set of sensors so you have some that are kind of automatic like motion sensors for example step count etc and others that kind of um, are more manual so mood for example and based on this all the data collected you have analysis so what is the normal behavior of a person and what are the deviation uh, from those kind of interactions and from that, we have almost the coordination. So how do you use um, the, the people in their support to, to plan for intervention? So for example, letting someone know that they need to interact with, with other people or implementing a plan to change in activity of one person uh, through interactions uh, to, to kind of enforce, to, to reach the kind of the goal of minimizing social isolation and then deploying the intervention here is like the execution of the plan which which is recommendation around how to the people you need to interact with to minimize social isolation so here there was there was basically two two parts so there was the the, um, the architecture around uh, planning and intervention which is like the synthesis so purely uh, pla planning based and there was also the, the almost the perception around data analysis which was all a, a machine learning based and kind of putting this architecture together raised a lot of kind of issues in terms of the language used for each step so kind of broadly speaking in terms of you know data analysis it was all about, for example, what data we collect, how do we collect it? And it was also in terms of, you know, you implement, you extract the data to understand uh, the problem as a whole and you focus on the whole problem. On the other hand, and that's kind of also the, the, the planning or the software engineering practice where it was, it's all about computation. So you want to have a behavior to, to reason about you want to to basically understand to, so you want to understand what are the different components how do they interact what are their relationship in order to to start implementing the architecture and the whole kind of purpose is to divide to conquer so how what are the different components and how they interact in order to to kind of design the system and that kind of created somehow uh, differences in when how you design the analysis and how you design the, the, the planning intervention. 
So one way we, we're going about it is, is basically through requirement. And the requirements are basically the common language between the two. So that leads us to kind of an architecture that, that mixes the two where basically you, you define you start defining a system through what requirements you want to achieve. And those requirements will, will lead you to a mediation vocabulary around the data, what data you, is, uh, you, you need to collect. The, the analysis of the data gives you somehow an insight in that will allow you to, to, to kind of refine your requirement and, and collect more data. And that's what kind of almost closes the loop around the, the, um, the kind of the requirement and the, the data. So it's more of a closed loop that's kind of weaving them together. So <laughs> to, to end up to, to go into the um, kind of the summary between putting together this kind of machine learning and software engineering, then maybe the, the common language, what brings them together is that, that requirement, because it allows you to understand the problem and guide the collection of the data. And um, that's kind of uh, what we are exploring right now. So thank you. And, uh, and that's it. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, thanks a lot for the nice overview and uh, yeah, the open questions in the end, basically. <laughs> uh, are there any questions from the audience? So um, I have a, a question about the <clears throat> what, what you mentioned last, um, where you had the basically the requirements and then you, you identified what data you need, but this also has a big impact on how the software system is built, right? Uh, and then um, basically changing the software system again, uh, this, this changes again the, the data you have available. So how does this, um, is this just a, a cycle that, that never ends or at some point stabilizes or how is that? Uh... <laughs> so the, the, that, that's why we kind of use it, use the requirement before deploying the architecture because they act as an intermediary around rather than deploying the whole architecture you deploy uh, a model oh. of it so the requirement act as a as a proxy to the architecture although between the, the, the so to, to collect the, the data for example and that's kind of also the Thing where you want to fail quickly, so you don't deploy the whole architecture before starting to to collect the data. Mm, okay. So deploy the, the requirement allows you to 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 kind of define what are the minimal questions that allow you to understand better the problem, rather than having a final model for your for your data analysis. Okay, good. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Are there any other questions? No. <laughs> uh, then maybe one more uh, about the basically when you have this um, requirements based uh, view on, on the system, uh, does this also help for evolution of the system? So when somebody comes and says, well, now we need to change the, the way our system is built because we want to incorporate maybe energy consumption of the house where the person lives in or something. Um, do you think this uh, like central view on the requirements also helps there? Uh, I think y yes. Because it's also defined which, which, for example, components you need and which, which um, data you need to collect. So I'll give you. I have a small example around um, what kind of. So that's also inspiring, um, Arisha. <laughs> so something like. Um, So in, in the in the example I gave in the beginning around uh, allowing um, I see. so 
around, for example, allowing different components to talk to, to each other. So the components by the end here, they have, for example, an LTL formula and how the behavior work. And that allows you to go to, for example, I need motion, I need object recognition. For this requirement, I need a, a text to speech. So you go from a high level requirement, which is, for example, here we had like a void that our groom is accessible it, to, to kind of different features. So that these are the features that allows you to connect exactly to the data you, you, you are involving. Now, one of, the, one of the challenges is, for example, this is kind of a simplified LTL formula, <laughs> while a lot of the, the data system don't work with LTL. <laughs> So you have an optimization function, but that's pretty much the optimization function can lead you to which feature you need to deploy and then which data you need to, to approach here. I don't know whether it answers the question. Yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you.